Okay, we'll get started. Uh, my name is Tom Lastman. I'm the rocketry, one of the rocketry curators here at the Air and Space Museum. And I'm going to take just a few minutes to talk to you this afternoon about uh, the shift from disposable to reusable rocketry in the 1970s with the Space Shuttle Orbiter. So we're just going to head back into uh, the space hangar and uh, we'll start there. Okay, well, again, welcome. And you can see right here to my left is the Space Shuttle Orbiter, which is the, the U.S.'s first uh, winged reusable uh, spacecraft. Now, this was the NASA finalized this concept in 1972, but the idea actually, the notion of a reusable winged vehicle goes, goes back decades before then. Actually, back to the 1930s, even before that, and it appeared in a number of different um, contexts. One was in the science fiction literature. Some of you might be familiar with Buck Rogers in the 1930s, the notion of winged space vehicles. But at the same time, aerodynamicists and engineers were very interested in this technology as well uh, in developing the concept. And especially during and after World War II, work in this field continued, both in Europe and in the United States, but especially in the United States after World War II. In fact, NASA's predecessor agency, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which had been set up in 1915, had a very long tradition, of course, in aircraft. And that tradition and culture carried over into its, into its successor organization, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, which Eisenhower set up in 1958. So this, this idea, this notion of a winged vehicle was very much at the forefront of, uh, of in, the, in the technical community throughout the early, or throughout, I'm sorry, through the 1940s and into the 1950s, but that all changed very quickly in 1957 when NASA launched, or I'm sorry, when the Soviets, excuse me, uh, launched Sputnik, which was the world's first artificial uh, satellite aboard a long-range ballistic missile. This changed everything. That act alone stunned the United States. It uh, caused jittery nerves in the White House, so much so that Eisenhower ordered a crash program to develop a long-range ballistic missile capability in the United States to counter uh, what he and his military advisors perceived to be a growing Soviet threat. Part of this, of the Cold War and the rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union was also played out in the space race. In 1961, Kennedy, President Kennedy is standing before Congress and he says, we're going to send a man to the moon by the end of the decade. NASA basically leads that effort. So under a very rigid time schedule, rather than develop a brand new launch vehicle for it, what NASA did basically is it adapted military missiles which had been under, under a crash program of development, and basically just put astronauts on top of these missiles to get them into space and eventually to get them into the moon. Now, part of the reason we're standing here is I just want you to look to my right, and in fact, you can see a number of the space capsules that were used on, milita on military launch vehicles in, starting in the late 1950s and all the way through the 1960s. For example, here we have a capsule, uh, the Friendship 7 capsule, which actually uh, was used in the Mercury program, which was the first manned spaceflight program, and it was put aboard that missile, which is all the way in the back, an Army Redstone missile. It was a cheap, effective way to get an astronaut into space very quickly. And basically what NASA did is it kept on building on that technology until finally, with the Apollo program and the lunar program, they got here, which is the Saturn V. Now keep in mind, all of these rockets up to this point, they're disposable. All you're trying to do, if you look at that last capsule at the end, that's a boilerplate, a mock-up, essentially, of, the, of an Apollo lunar capsule. And if you look here, it sits way at the top of this rocket. So you've got to start with this huge launch vehicle, which is essentially disposable stages as it ascends up into the, through the atmosphere and into space, to get that tiny capsule at the top with the astronauts to the moon and back. So in the late 60s, and one point I want to make here that's important is, what, is that NASA's human spaceflight program in the, in the 60s is basically running on a blank check. NASA's budget is peaks in the 60s. So at the time that the moon landings are going on, NASA's already thinking about the next step. What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And what kind of launch vehicle are we going to have? That's where the shuttle comes in. So there's a switch from disposable to this earlier concept of a winged vehicle, which had been underway actually at NASA all through the 1960s on a, on a very low level, but they never quite gave it up. They wanted to get back to this idea as quickly as possible. So what I want to do now actually for the second part of this, I want to walk around the back of the shuttle into a model case on the other side there and I'll continue the, the discussion.
Um, so just to recap quickly, put yourself back about 1970 or so with the winding down of the Apollo program, and NASA's already beginning to think about its next major mission, which included not just possibly a return to the moon, but to get a space station into orbit and possibly a mission to Mars. So they were really, they had these really ambitious plans for the post-Apollo uh, human spaceflight program. And then they, as I indicated earlier, what they were trying to do is revive this early, this idea of a winged reusable launch vehicle. Now what NASA wanted to do was to create a fully reusable launch vehicle. And what I have here in this case are, a number, are some, some of the various concept models that were introduced from the, about the late 1960s through the final concept decision of 1972. And I want to talk about just a couple of these for a few minutes. Now I just mentioned that NASA was interested in a fully reusable vehicle. So they had the orbiter like this, and it was going to be taken up on a booster rocket, essentially. And both were going to be reusable. And if you look at this model in the back, this is a typical concept. It ha and this, the, the large booster essentially looks like an airplane, so with a series of rocket engines in the back. Take the orbiter up for ascent, and the orbiter does its mission around the Earth and comes back along with the booster. There was a big problem, though. Unlike the 1960s where NASA had a, essentially a blank checkbook, that was no longer the case in the early 70s. Things had changed dramatically. Uh, the U.S. was in, is in the midst of a very unpopular war in Vietnam. There was a lot of social unrest at home. The economy was already beginning to slow. And the, you know, the, the White House and Congress, their interests were focused elsewhere, not on the space program. And so what happened is NASA's budget got cut dramatically. And so what happened is they no longer could push for a re they, th this idea of pushing for a fully reusable launch vehicle proved especially difficult to do. So a number of alternatives came up. One was the Air Force. The Air Force was very interested in a reusable vehicle for classified military operations. And what the Air Force favored actually was a partially reusable vehicle like this one. This is the Lockheed Star Clipper, which was introduced in the late 60s. And it's a very interesting design. You'll notice on the sides, this large triangle, those are essentially are the booster rockets, and they're disposable. And then the shuttle, which has its own engines, is in the middle. So the booster carries it up, it disengages, goes away, it's disposable, and then the orbiter flies and does its, and does its missions. It does its mission. Uh, now the benefit of, I want to talk a little bit about the pros and cons between full reusability and partial reusability. NASA wanted the full reusability, which had very high development costs. To go for a full reusable vehicle, you have to put a lot into research, development, engineering. But over the long term, it was supposed to be cheaper. Because if it's all reusable, you're not going to have to build new components for it all the time. With the partially reusable, it has lower upfront costs, but higher operational costs, because you've got to keep, keep building new tanks over, the, over the, the course of the orbiter's operation. But the budget cuts essentially went out, and NASA had to give up full reusability, and it went with the partial design. But it still had a lot of decisions to, to make about what the booster configuration would look like, what the wing configuration would look like, and so on. And so let me talk about some of the, some of the various models here. Uh, let's talk about wing design. So you'll notice on its early fully reusable concept, it's a straight wing, straight wing design. And then if you look at what they actually chose, that's a delta wing. Well, the straight wing had the advantage of it was lighter, had less heating surface area during atmospheric reentry, but it had a very low cross range. And what that means is that the point of entry back into the Earth's atmosphere had to be very close to the runway. It didn't have a lot of maneuverability, so it had to be very close to where it was going to land. The Air Force didn't want that. The Air Force wanted a system that was going to have very high cross range so that it would be able to maneuver and could land farther away from its point of entry. But the problem with that, and that's the delta wing, the Air Force favored the delta wing. The problem with the delta wing is you had higher, uh, you had a higher weight, it was heavier, and you had greater surface area for heating during atmospheric re-entry. Um, the Air Force essentially went out on that one and they picked the delta wing. Uh, another one had to do with what was the booster gonna look like? Well, if you look at these two models right here with the red stripes on them, that were introduced by a team of uh, Grumman and Boeing. Now, in, th in this particular case, if you look at the booster rockets, uh, the boosters, they're actually fully reusable, but I don't want you to pay attention to that. I want you to focus just on the orbiters. 
Now the orbiters, all the earlier designs, the engines are in the orbiter and the fuel is actually inside the orbiter as well. And if you look at this model right here, uh, the fuel tanks are inside the orbiter. But if you look at the one next to it, the orbiter's a lot smaller and you'll notice the fuel tanks are on the sides. They're disposable. So the idea was if we go with the if we go with disposable fuel tanks, you get more room inside for experiments or whatever it is that you're going to do. So NASA basically went with an external fuel tank for the orbiter. And if you look at this model, which is very similar to the current space shuttle model, where you have the orbiter, the two booster rockets, and the fuel tank in the middle, that fuel tank is disposable. If you've seen it launch on television, you see the tank drop away after the space shuttle main engines, of which we have a real one right here, are finished uh, are finished burning. So that was another decision they had to make. And lastly, the last one I'll talk about is the configuration of the booster rocket. So here with NASA's original fully reusable version, it's going to be uh, it's going to be able to return to the Earth after the boost stage. If you look at this model here with the USA on it and the black and white markings, which was introduced I think by North American Rockwell, it's basically a version of the uh, uh, adopted from the Saturn V technology, and it's a, it's a liquid propellant rocket, and then the shuttle and the external fuel tank for the shuttle are on top. Now, liquid propellants were had been used for a long time. They were uh, you know they were reliable, they were safe, they were more cumbersome to use. So NASA opted again with the budget, wanted to go for something cheaper. So it went with solid propellants for the booster rockets, but they had never used solid propellants for a human spaceflight program. Solid propellants were used primarily on military weapon systems, uh, like the Poseidon, submarine launch ballistic missile, solid propellant, or the ICBM force. Those were all solid propellant missiles. Um, so they were taking a bit of a risk using them for uh, uh, sending astronauts into space, but they were confident that they would be able to do it. And in fact, uh, the current booster rockets on the space shuttle, which again, look very similar to these, are all solid propellant. Um, so I'll talk just a little bit more about the Enterprise. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this actually never flew in space. It was a test vehicle only. Um, this is a, a real space shuttle main engine that we have in our collection, and there were three of these mounted on the back of the orbiter, and you can just see these are, of course, are mock-ups uh, of the engines. Uh, they generated in combination a little over a million pounds of thrust during liftoff. Um, so that's about it. If you have any other questions, I'd be happy to, to answer them. Thank you for listening to this edition of Ask an Expert. A companion question and answer session for this lecture may also be available. For a schedule of upcoming Ask an Expert lectures at the museum, please visit www.nasm.si.edu.